lecture I give you this afternoon, I would willingly give uh, to the Liberal Party or the Labor Party or the Democrats and the Greens, but I know full well that they'll never ask me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, uh, but that is a good point to start, because I think you should uh, look at what I have to say very carefully and work out why it is that the things I discussed with you this afternoon are never discussed in the media, uh, in the television or the newspapers, uh, virtually never discussed in, in parliaments, in federal or state. And we have to look very carefully, as I show you at the beginning, we have to work out who is really in charge of the national economy. Who is really planning for the future of Australia? Who is thinking about national development? And these are the questions I, I ask. Welcome to Citizens Insight, the interview series of the Australian Citizens Party. I'm Glenn Isherwood. Thanks for joining me. The purpose of this program is to bring interviews with knowledgeable Australians on issues of economic development and the problems facing our economy at a local, state and federal level. But today I want to deviate from the normal format of the program and bring you a special presentation. I would like to introduce to you Professor Lance Endersby, who passed away in 2009, but the Citizens Party had the great privilege of having him address our conferences and campaign events across the nation from 1997 to 2009. Lance Endersby was a veteran of the Snowy Mountains hydroelectric scheme. He worked under the Director of Construction, William Hudson. He went on to work for Tassie Hydro. And in his teaching role, he was the Pro-Chancellor of Monash University and Dean of Engineering, and also the former President of the Institute of Engineers Australia. And for all of that, he was awarded the Order of Australia. In his final years, he devoted his time and world-leading expertise to put on the table policies and ideas to integrate Australia, to improve its economic development. I have compiled all of the video presentations that Lance gave to us from 1997 to 2009, and they have been posted on YouTube and will be available as this is also posted. So check those out. What I'd like to cover on the show today are excerpts from those presentations. So let's jump in. The clips I've compiled today cover seven subjects. First, we look at Lance's history, where he recounts the experience on the Snowy Scheme and on Tassie Hydro and his pioneering work. Secondly, Lance's views on economy and the Asian century. Third, his criticisms of the current economic system and especially privatisation. Four, his ideas for integrating rail and road transport across Australia. Five, water projects, including the Clarence River Scheme and the Northern Rivers of the Ord, Fitzroy, Victoria and Flinders Rivers development projects. Then we're going to look at the issue of the obstructions. Lance covers the issue of national development projects in conflict with sovereign states and the disputes that arise. And finally, Lance's views on culture, having the expertise and training programs for young people that can get us out of the current mess today. Just before we jump into it, let me make a plug for Lance's book, A Voyage of Discovery. Nothing captures Lance's journey and intellectual pursuits better than this book. It is available for purchase through the Citizens Party online store and that website is shop.citizensparty.org.au. If you have any questions about any of the material covered in today's program, give our team a call on 1800 636 432. So this first clip now, Lance recounting his experiences working on the Snowy Mountain Scheme and Tassie Hydro. And so after the war, uh, we uh, started uh, uh, getting on developing plans for the uh, building of the Snowy Mountains project. But there are other people around the world also looking at all sorts of new plans for redevelopment. 
And uh, we started this project, the Act went through in 1949, and we then had an immediate problem because we really didn't have the strength in depth within our organisation to get on with the job. We started off with a commissioner who was a hard-bitten old hydroelectric construction engineer. He knew exactly what he was doing and he was a wonderful leader and a bunch of young engineers like myself. Well, tell us more now. How did the Snowy Mountain uh, training come about that you could go from one thing to another? Okay. Well, what happened was that we just had this two or three senior people with the background and a bunch of young engineers. And uh, one of the things that we did was that the Snowy organization entered into a contract with the United States government whereby we paid, this is Australian money, no aid or anything like this, was, you know, we paid. We paid the Bureau of Reclamation in Denver, Colorado to help us with the design of the uh, first major uh, tunnels and the first major dam, or two dams, and, and in the process uh, help us by training some of the young engineers. And so in, uh, in 1952, uh, I was sent to Denver, Colorado, and I, I was told by the Snowy that I had to learn to be an expert in uh, uh, tunnels and underground construction. In how long? Oh, I, I, as quick as possible. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was sent to Denver, and, and the Bureau of Engineers, they set us down, and I sat down at an empty drawing board, and I started to draw up the first tunnel, the 14-mile uh, long Eucombe Diversion Tunnel. And so I, I did that, and I was beavering away there for, uh, for 12 months. And it was wonderful working with these Bureau engineers, because they were all 20 and 30 years older than me. And they had all this experience. Yeah, and they just sort of saunter up on my desk and say, why don't you do think about this or have a go at that? And every now and again they'd disappear and they'd come back with a book or a specification with a few things ma uh, marked in it for me. And there was this wonderful relationship between these uh, older Bureau of Reclamation engineers and the team of 12 young Australians. And of course, you can imagine being Australians, there was lots of banter and, and everybody had a good time. And after 12 months, I was going back to, uh, uh, to Australia with a bundle of drawings and specifications, so sort I'm of hoping I could uh, answer all the questions <laughs> when I got home and the details. Did, and it worked, right? <laughs> oh, yes. And so we then got on with calling tenders and getting on with the construction of the projects. And then there was another nice development uh, the Bureau of Reclamation had a number of older engineers in their late 60s, 70s, who had been construction engineers on, uh, or resident engineers on Grand Canyon or mm -hmm. Grand Coulee, you name it. Some of them in the Colorado Big Thompson. And they had these construction engineers who'd been there and done it. And so we arranged for them to come and, and stay with us for a period of 12 months or so. And they sat down with us and they helped us uh, with the administration of these very large contracts. You know, these were you know, multi-million dollar contracts, uh, quite huge things in those days. And once again, the relationships were rather wonderful. Because we'd get into a problem with a contract and we're worrying about this and that. And they'd say, well, this is the way we did it at Palisades. <laughs> <laughs> and off they'd go and they'd come back with some data for us. And of course, there was absolutely wonderful relations. And the project was built on time and within the estimate. And, and it was a great complex project. And it was this sort of harmonious relationship uh, with the Bureau that uh, helped it along. And then you built more uh, underground power facilities yes. and that kind of thing. Well, you see, when, when you start off with a rocket behind you, <laughs> which happened to me, uh, and this applied to most of the young Australians that were involved in this, because of the fact that they were expected to become experts, they are trained to be experts. Within about eight years or so, we're operating at, at, at world front. And the interesting thing is that uh, uh, we were, had already been working on the design and construction of two large underground power stations. And at that time, the Bureau of Reclamation had not designed and built an underground power so station. So that was a first? Yes. And so, no, the Bureau of Reclamation they were watching us. So these are underground turbine stations. Oh yes, absolutely. Okay. Large underground built... power stations. Well, well, there are two in the in the in the Snowy scheme, and I worked on the first one of those, 
But by then, as we were completing this first large underground power station, I was then invited to go to Tasmania, where the Hydroelectric Commission in Tasmania were designing and building their first underground power station. So I, I, I went to Tasmania, and uh, once again we, uh, we had a government instrumentality, a government utility, and we had an interesting charter uh, from the Tasmanian government as a government utility. Tasmania is a hydroelectric island. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and the, in effect, the orders from the government were we were to generate the lowest cost hydropower in the world so that uh, we would attract industries to Tasmania. And so, in other words, as a government department, we were ordered by the, the government to operate at the frontiers of technology and design and construction to keep the prices as low as possible. And you can only do that by technical excellence. Yeah. And, and so we were encouraged again. Um, we were the first in the world to uh, uh, use hard rock tunneling machines, boring tunnels. And, and that was an interesting exercise in that um, uh, we wanted to drill these several miles of uh, tunnels through hard rock in sed uh, hard sedimentary sandstones and things like that. And we found uh, in America there was a, uh, a firm that had built a, a soft shale cutting machine. For shale, phase. not coal? No, no, not soft okay. shale. This was at the Missouri River on one of the Missouri projects. Yes. And uh, one of the Missouri River projects. And this was a Corps of Engineers project. And, and they had used, uh, uh, for a fairly short distance, a, a soft shell cutting machine. But we saw that they had the, um, uh, the electric motor drive system, which we wanted. So we, wanted, we got in touch with this firm in Seattle. There's some problems there uh, with the firm. And in essence, the, the Hydroelectric Commission in Tasmania provided funds to refloat <laughs> this company in Seattle, so here's a government department doing this sort of thing, to help us um, uh, design and build this hard rock tunneling machine which we were going to ship to Tasmania. And it worked. And it worked. We, we sent our plant engineers over there. They worked in Seattle with the firm in Seattle. And then uh, it came, they came back to Australia with the machine. We put it up to the face and it worked like a charm. We realized we couldn't get the muck away quick enough we were oh, doing so well, had to haul out the uh, so, yeah. so we had to put a whole, redesign the conveyor belt yeah. system and everything else to move the muck quickly, and we were breaking world records. The next set of clips is Lance discussing his view of economy and Australia's opportunity in the Asian century. We then jump to his condemnation of current economic policies, especially privatisation. Now, I do a fair bit of work in looking at economic development in non-monetary terms. For about 20 or 30, more, 30 and 40 years, I have used other measures of economic growth because I have found that the economists repeatedly have it wrong because they get hooked up on dollar values, currency exchange rate, interest rates, you name it, and you can't work out what's happening in a country. But if I work with things like kilowatt hours, a kilowatt hour is the same in any country, a kilo, kilowatt hour is a kilowatt hour. A kilowatt hour runs the same lights in all countries of the world. A kilowatt hour drives, drives the same factories. And there it is. Now, this shows the world growth in electricity production just plotted on an arithmetic scale uh, for, I've got 29 years of data. So there's 29 years of data of the world growth in electricity production, and it's a dead straight line <laughs> for 29 years growth. Now, once again, in Australia, we have to have a comprehension of the magnitude of the growth of the world in industrial terms, and this chart enables us to do it. For comparison, the annual growth in the world corresponds to an increase equal to the entire present production of Australia every seven months. So in other words, if you think of all the electricity supply in, in, in Perth and all the lights and, and all the factories, all the generating plant and the transmission lines and all throughout Western Australia, 
and then add to that South Australia, and then add to that Victoria, and all the generating plants and transmission lines and the snowy mountains and the hydro in Tasmania, and you add New South Wales and Queensland, and add it all up, that growth in the world is at such a rate that they can provide all of Australia's needs for electricity every seven months. It's a huge growth in world industrial capacity and that is another factor we have to take into account. This is just electricity production, uh, Asian Six in Australia, up until fairly recently. And you can see they're galloping along. And they are going to be in a position where they can invest in Australia and buy what we have to offer. And there they are. You've got three billion people up there. See the numbers? Australia is facing a different future. We're having growing and powerful neighbours. How can we cope? How should we cope? Should we be growing and powerful too? And I'm suggesting to you we should be growing and powerful and let's get on with seeing how we're going to do it. And so this is what's happened. Our production and our exports are insufficient to pay the bills. We borrow money and we're living, Australia is living beyond its means. And this means that industries, and I'm, because one of my sons is in manufacturing and industry and I know these costs, if you look at the service sector, that is in effect an overhead on production. And, and since the 1950s, it's been steadily increasing. It's gone from about 70% to 400%. And that is the burden that all our manufacturers and exporters have to carry. Every farm, mine and factory carries this impost as they struggle to compete in world markets. So. And here's the public capital expenditure that's declined. So governments have walked away from, uh, from public capital expenditure and they've gone for greater and greater services. How have they funded it? Creative accounting. And in the decade of the 90s, Australian governments raised $100 billion without any taxation. They just sold the assets of the people. And so, if you look at the global comparisons, total sales in Australia in billions of dollars, here's Australia and New Zealand, Hungary, Argentina, Malaysia, Brazil, Mexico, we're in good company, but the interesting thing is that we were the best. Australia may raise more revenue per head from privatisation in that decade. Australia and New Zealand, we were the grand champions in, in going off to the cash converters and in, in just flogging off the assets of the people to the cash converters. We were the grand champions of the world. Can you ever imagine getting that into the newspapers or on the TV? No way. But that's, that's the reality of it. Oh, they'd all talk about market forces. The consequences. It's created an overseas debt borne by all Australians. When Victoria sold off its SEC and the debt was taken up, uh, uh, they were bought by an American company, that became a debt for all Australia. So the Austra Victorian government just sidestepped this debt that was borne by the people of Australia. The pension funds that used to invest in, you know, the border works bonds and the other bonds and all the rest of it, they got their money back and were told to put it on the stock exchange. That caused the stock market to go up and the government said, look, what benefits <laughs> we had. It was a one-off cash gain and they used the cash gain to fund the services. In Victoria they said, look at all the schools and hospitals we're supporting. Money raised without taxation. And the flow of overseas funds led to increases in share values, property values, executive salaries, and you know, you look at the prices of houses in Sydney and Melbourne. Whole suburbs of million dollar houses. And it's absolutely scandalous, and it's been helped by this business of sale of public assets. For Lance, as you'll see in these next clips, his passion was unifying and integrating Australia from coast to coast.
How do we get our product to market faster? And one of the projects I want to describe to you today is this project here, which is a fast uh, rail system from the uh, major parts of Australia through to Darwin, and then fast shipping to these ports. Oh, thank you. And uh, the idea includes a high-speed rail freight system, say 250 kilometres an hour, and that's not too bad, that's fairly modest. In, and the idea is that we'll be able to have fast shipping between Darwin and Singapore, and all these other places. To give you a clue as to the nature of the markets, there are four ports on the north coast of Java there. Those four ports on the north coast of Java are now moving as many containers per annum as Rotterdam, which is the major port for Europe. And that is two days sailing from Darwin. So we have a port, the capacity of Rotterdam just there, two days sailing from Darwin. Of course, Singapore is the largest port in the world. Uh, the second largest port in the world is Hong Kong. And the third largest port in the world is Kaohsiung in Taiwan. And so Darwin is within a few days sailing of the three, and effectively, if you count Java as a port, the four largest ports in the world. The distance from Darwin to Singapore is the same distance as the length of the Mediterranean. The sea state is mostly fairly uh, flat. In other words, it's calm seas most of the time. So that means we can contemplate fast ferries servicing these areas and so we can have daily ferry services from Darwin to Java, Darwin to Singapore and so on. That means we can be from Melbourne through to Darwin in less than a day, two days sailing, three days total, we've got a market of a hundred million people and other markets there in three and four and, and five days. So we can guarantee deliveries from Australia to what is effectively about uh, the ports for four billion people, we can guarantee deliveries from Australia to those within one week. So this is my proposal here in relation to the Murray-Darling Basin and the green are the irrigation works. And I've done enough work on this project now to so know that if this goes ahead, we'll have one train a day at least from the uh, murray goulburn Echuca area. In other words, the farmers would be growing all the crops, uh, changing their cropping for that purpose. One train a day from here, and one train a day from up there. We'd have at least three trains a day going through to Darwin, just from this Murray-Darling Basin. Because of the fact that the Constitution uh, gave these permanent powers to state governments and reinforce the state ports and rail system, it means that the crops that we develop are what you call tyrannia distance crops. We only grow those things where time is not a consequence. Can you get the idea? The wool stockpile is a good example. It took us three years to flog the wool stockpile. Time was not a consequence. Uh, wool will store, wheat will store, rice will store, cotton will store, canned fruits will store, dried fruits will store. So a lot of the things we make in Australia are what you call tyranny of distance crops. And we're moving to a stage where the world with its supermarkets and fresh foods and everything else doesn't play that game anymore. And so there's a whole set of new markets. And I've demonstrated that on this... Uh, slide here, if I can push it up a bit, so it always keeps creeping back. Uh, you can imagine that if we reduce the time or distance to market, the farmers can move up a profit curve. You can easily see that for things like grains and grazing and canned and dried fruits, that time and distance to market are not critical, but also the returns on the investment are low. But as you, can, if, as you move towards intensive horticulture, fresh fruit and vegetable and shelf life foods, the profits are greater. 
And uh, we've got farmers in Australia trying to get over this tyranny of distance down in Kua. You're up there sending asparagus to Japan by air. And they, they're climbing over a hurdle of $4 a kilogram just to get that asparagus into Japan. But there's a whole range of, of possibilities. So as I, soon as I present that uh, chart, and I've done that down in Gippsland to the farmers in Gippsland, and, and just to, on Friday night to the farmers in, uh, in Echuca, they, they wouldn't let me go home on Friday night. They all wanted to chat to me. And, and they saw this immediately, and they realized what it had meant to them. By going through that sort of exercise, I was able to work out the total volume of freight, and I find up in this area here, uh, I need double track. Uh, and and uh, because we're bringing in phosphate hill, and we'll be bringing phosphate from there back to the farmers, we'll be exporting phosphate to people over here, we'll be exporting uh, copper, lead and zinc ores this way, we'll be integrating with Timor Sea Oil and Gas here and bringing fuels back into Australia, but the manufacturers in Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane will be integrating their activities with manufacturers over here. And just remember, there are 800,000 people engaged in manufacturing in those cities there, and their future depends on integration with manufacturers around the world. Now, you've heard an awful lot about microeconomic reform and all the rest of it. Just remember that they're trying to compete with integrated industries over here, and if these guys don't, do not have access to those markets, they're going to go backwards. There we are, right. Now, in the last hundred years, uh, Australia has been changing. And the idea of trying to keep uh, the states developing equally is not working out very well. And so, in this chart, I'm showing the market share ratio of the changing distribution of population, gross state product, and electricity consumption. Now, I want to point out to you, in effect, that there is a newer industrial Australia Queensland and Western Australia and the Northern Territory, the population are voting with their feet and the gross trade products are moving that way. And you can see that these are mirror images of the same thing. And electricity consumption is increasing. So you can see the way electricity consumption is a leading indicator of uh, the state development. So in effect, we have newer industrial Australia, older industrial Australia, and it is now a task of national management to integrate it more effectively. How do we integrate older industrial Australia so that it can work together with newer Australia? And that's what I'll show you in the next slide. And this is one of the things I want to do. I want to make sure that these new Mineral and mining developments over here are uh, uh, um, great steel mills are being proposed along the uh, uh, coast of Western Australia based on the iron ore and the abundant supplies of natural gas in the Timor Sea. And so we're seeing the prospect <coughs> of major steel industries on the west coast of Western Australia. The way they're going ahead with it, they are just not interested in the rest of Australia. They just see this as an opportunity to develop trade with the world, and they're dealing with the Koreans and the Taiwanese and the Chinese and others and getting on with the job. So if we're going to have Australian enterprises taking part in those jobs, we've got to build the infrastructure to, to uh, make that integration possible. The way these projects are now going ahead, within the mining industry, for example, worldwide, they now have a buying cartel, effectively, to purchase bits and pieces for uh, the mining sector, the, uh, the big transports they use, and, and the mining equipment. And uh, they, in effect, call tenders on a world basis, and people tender over the internet, and they have their preferred suppliers. 
And some of my Melbourne manufacturing friends were telling me the other day, they've looked at this list of preferred suppliers for all of these major mining companies in Australia and around the world, and there is not one Australian company on the list of preferred suppliers. So in effect, we're being shut out, and somehow or other we have to assert our interest and assert our capability, and this is one of the things I'd like to do. And we start building a few things in Australia that, that focus attention on Australian potential. Now onto the subject of water. The Australian Citizens Party worked with Lance on a major report proposing 18 major water projects. That's available on our website and it's the blueprint for economic development. Here is Lance discussing some of those projects. So here are the projects I've been thinking. I want to talk to you about the Fitzroy River, huge possibilities for irrigation in that area. The Ord and the Victoria Rivers, we're only to develop the Ord, but the Victoria is there. We've got the Daly and the Roper, we've got the Gulf Rivers, and we've got the Flinders River inland diversion. We've got possibilities for Clarence and further development of the Snowy. So there's a lot we can do on water projects. <laughs> the Clarence River in New South Wales floods every few years. I've got a proposal to divert that salt-free water into the Darling. Can you imagine the wonderful impact of that? You know, they don't want that flood water. We can store the flood waters and divert it down the Darling. The New South Wales government and the new conservationists there have told me it was totally unacceptable. Is the catchment of the Clarence River. And it's a wonderful little cup in there and very steep country, high rainfall, and one of the highest rainfall areas in Australia. And they get the summer rains from the monsoons coming down and they get the winter rains as well. So there's a lot of rainfall there and it all flows out to the sea. And if you've been to Grafton, you know how wide the Clarence River is in Grafton. It's a big river. So I've worked out, designed a scheme for the diversion of the Clarence into the Darling. Now, as you know, there's a lot of algae in the Darling and I've coloured it green there. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> And, and, and you can see that this would flush all the algae out of the, the Darling. I've designed this as a pump storage scheme. There's a surplus of thermal energy, coal-fired thermal energy from the Hunter and the, the Trobe Valley, and there's a surplus of thermal energy on the national grid. And the national grid just goes right through there, just past the project. And uh, because there's a surplus of thermal energy on the national grid, and because of the fact that they're running coal-fired thermal stations, which take a long time to warm up. You get the idea? And once they're operating, they don't have to keep on operating. And so we've got this surplus of thermal energy overnight and at weekends. And so the thermal power station operators, with the creation of the national grid, things are all right with the, if you like, with the uh, integrated state system. But once they're on the national grid, these, uh, and particularly the, the international operators that are now brought into the power system, they were offering negative prices for overnight and weekend power. In other words, they would pay you to take their electricity, to run your factory overnight and at weekends. And of course, this was uh, pretty much a bonanza. But the whole object of it was that if you ran your factory overnight and at weekends, they were able to, uh, and, and, and they supplied, these thermal power stations supplied you with the power. Somebody else in the system had to shut down and if you've got a thermal power station which is sort of being fed by boilers and, and it's all hot and what have you, once it cools down, that might take you another day or so to get it warmed up again. So by offering negative prices overnight and weekends, they were deliberately trying to put their op opposition out of business. And so things got pretty ruthless. And, uh, and of course, I was, uh, I've been a member of the Energy Council down there in Tasmania and we've been looking very seriously at a bass straight cable. And so I knew that there was a surplus of thermal energy overnight and at weekends. And so with this Clarence diversion, rather than tunnelling through the mountains, I could pump it up the hill. And so I've devised a scheme whereby we pump uh, at, at uh, overnight and at weekends and we generate at peak times on the way down the hill. And the project's economic. And so I've been working on that. And... Uh, uh, 
but the worst is yet to come. So the project's economic, and uh, that's the sort of thing. It involves uh, dams and pumps and uh, head storages here on the Great Divide near Tenterfield, and then another dams and power station going down the hill. Uh, in an my wife doesn't like this chart because it's highly exaggerated, but I do it for engineering reasons, not for public display. But uh, you see, uh, this is a highly exaggerated vertical scarp. But there's the Pacific Ocean down there, and here's the cascade of storages. We pump up the hill, we have a head pond there, and we generate down that way. Water resources. Right through there, the rain comes down in the monsoon season and all sorts of crops can be grown just in a, in a, in a few months. And if you like, in, from December uh, uh, through to May, you've got wonderful potential for crops and the rain just comes out of the sky. Virtually nothing is grown. And the reason for it is there's no access to markets. And I've been up there in the Gulf Country chatting to farmers and they've been showing me the crops that they grow and then just allow, allow to die on the vine because they couldn't, couldn't get it down to market. And the Queensland government says they've got to take it across there and take it all the way down. <laughs> but so there is enormous potential and it doesn't need irrigation and doesn't need great dams or anything else like that. The rain falls out of the sky every monsoon season there are crops that could be grown and the important thing is to provide access to the market. And there's surplus water available in runoff. 23% of Australia's national runoff is up in the Kimberley in the northwest and 23% is up in the Gulf Country. And you've got to get, you know, the idea of the magnitude of that. The Murray-Darling Basin is only 6% of Australia's runoff, they got 23 and 20. So the potential uh, in runoff and the potential in rainfall is truly enormous. And so I want to talk about various engineering projects that I've looked at. These are national water development projects. I'll show you something on the Clarence inland and a little comment on the Snowy. The Ord. The Ord was controversial from the beginning. Now, water supplied to farmland area about one quarter of what was originally planned. We really haven't developed the full potential of the Ord River the way it should have been. The project still has enormous potential as a food bowl for overseas markets. And the critical task is to provide the transport facilities. And uh, that includes overseas and other... But I've been looking at markets. What are the logical markets for the Ord? And I've been looking at integrated development. There's the boundary. There, there's the border between Western Australia and, and the Northern Territory. And over there we've got the Ord project and Lake Ark Isle and so on. Over here, there's even greater potential on the Victoria River and great potential for irrigation here, but that's in the Northern Territory. So nothing's done there, and things have been done for 40 years over there. And the sensible thing is to integrate the lot and make it a national development area. And so we've got to look at the crops. And one of the problems is that the Ord was developed on the basis of what we can call tyranny of distance crops. Can you get this, the concept? Because of the fact they can't get produce to market, they went for sugar. With sugar, it doesn't matter how long you take to get to the market. So sugar was a good crop for the Ord. But things like pumpkins, mangoes and bananas, you've got to get them to the market quickly. And so the Ord was originally developed on the basis of cotton and, 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 and uh, sugar. Uh, cotton's mostly phased out and sugar. But the real potential... Is, is in the fruit and vegetables. Now, here's the Fitzroy. Now, the Fitzroy, and I was here at Fitzroy Crossing, a huge catchment, uh, that there's a total flow of 9,000 
uh, gigalitres per annum. And, so, and, and it, it's comparable with the total water use, rainfall and everything else in the Murray-Darling Basin. So it's got a huge potential up there, totally uh, undeveloped. And there is potential for large dams and beautiful dam sites on the Margaret River and the uh, other rivers up there, the Leopold, and vast areas that can be developed for irrigation downstream. Enormous potential. And here's one of the gorges. It's just dying for a dam, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and there you are. And one of the other, there's a series of rivers that flow into the, and I've been thinking of a group of dams up there and pipeline that we could bring additional water down to the Murray-Darling Basin and into the Darling River. And it could be economic. And, but the point is, is that it's going through other country, through here, which is also has great potential for irrigation. So any water that's got there has got to run the economic hurdle of other, other uses on the way past. And here's one of the, uh, the Queensland government have told me very firmly, there's no way I can use that dam site because it's a national park. Uh, uh, nobody ever goes there. <laughs> so at this point we now shift to Lance discussing the impediments and obstacles to building these national projects, specifically the national interest in conflict with state interests. Firstly, he covers a very revealing story about the Snowy Mountain Scheme. Lance has a lot to say on this, so we can only cover it briefly in this video. For more, check out the full presentations on the channel. So the Commissioner came by uh, with Dr Savage, an eminent American engineer, and I showed them the work uh, that I was doing with tunnelling and shaft sinking and what have you, exploring the ground. Uh, the Commissioner congratulated me and uh, sent me a very nice letter uh, you know, saying what a wonderful job I was doing. And I was just a young engineer. I had about 40 men in the camp and uh, a lot of you know, German migrants and others and, and uh, problems that way, but we were getting on with the job. But the Commissioner also said, in effect, get on with the job as hard as you can, young fella, before they stop us. Okay? Get on with the job as fast as you can, young fellow, before they stop us. And what had happened is that the, there'd been a change in government and the states of Victoria and New South Wales were saying, don't spend the money on the Snowy Mountains scheme uh, and uh, uh, don't spend federal money on developing electricity. It'd be far better to develop electricity in the Latrobe Valley or the Hunter Valley using Victorian brown coal or New South Wales black coal and that the federal government did not have powers to develop electricity and sell it to the states. So they were saying the federal government does not have the power to build public works like that. And of course, not only were we developing electricity, we were diverting the waters inland to the Murray-Darling Basin, which covers all this, you know, several states, it covers New South Wales and Queensland and Victoria and South Australia. So even though we were diverting water for irrigation to service all these states, the states of Victoria and New South Wales were moved, shall we say, uh, to stop the project. And they were talking about going to the High Court to stop the project. If they had gone to the High Court to stop the project, the High Court would have been duty bound to stop it and make the legislation illegal. But Menzies realised that the founding fathers who wrote the Constitution in 1900 and before that could not have foreseen a multi-state project like the Snowy Mountain Scheme. So Menzies decided to tough it out. We continued to build the Snowy Mountain Scheme and it was nine years before the states of Victoria and New South Wales and South Australia passed legislation virtually one-line legislation, in effect endorsing the Snowy Mountains project as, uh, as, as being a, a proper task for the federal government to undertake. So in other words, the state said, we approve of the Snowy Mountains scheme. 
It took them nine years. We were building the scheme illegally for nine years. Um, but that was the last national project in Australia. That was the last. And from then on, the system has been paralysed. Australia has been paralysed. We cannot think of national development anymore or national infrastructure. The whole system is uh, reduced to state, states and state development. Uh, when I proposed, uh, first of all, when I was proposing this project, one of the major objections by the New South Wales government was that if they bought this water from that side of the range into, onto that side of the range, the protocols of the Murray-Darling Basin require that the water, in effect, be shared with Queensland, <laughs> New South Wales, and Victoria and South Australia. So if they're bringing water in, then naturally South Australia might be able to get some for Adelaide. The New South Wales government told me very firmly that if that project went ahead, it would only go ahead if all the water was used in New South Wales only. I then was looking at these projects up in Queensland and the response by the Queensland government people who heard me talking about this in Brisbane was that there would be no way any of that water would ever get down into New South Wales. It had to be used up there. And so this is the problem that we have. We can't look at these projects in an optimum way. Queensland have told me in no uncertain terms uh, that they are absolutely opposed to any rail link between Mount Isa and Darwin and Mount Isa in the Northern Territory. Because all Queensland freight, according to the Queensland Government, has to go out via Queensland ports and go on the Queensland rail system and there's no way they want a standard gauge rail going through there when the Queensland system is three foot six. But they've said, if you go this way through Brisbane, and all the way and you make all of that standard gauge, we'd let you do that. So in other words, if you're prepared to reconstruct the entire Queensland network, <laughs> the standard gauge, that lets you make a connection to Darwin, but not, not anything going through there like that. The New South Wales government have told me they would never agree to a rail connection north and south like that through New South Wales, because all New South Wales freight has to go out by the ports of Sydney and Newcastle and has to use New South Wales Rail. The government of Victoria have told me this is absolutely absurd because Melbourne is the logical central port for Australian trade with the world. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and the Western Australians say there's no point in going to Darwin, you might as well go to Perth. So everybody's got their own little interest and nobody's prepared to look at it on a national basis. In this final set of clips, Lance discusses competency, planning and policies that can get Australia's young people involved in building the nation. When you talk about 50 years of experience, I got pretty close to 60. <laughs> um, and, and I find that I'm rather a rare bird these days in the sense that I was there and did things which people with my background and training cannot do today in Australia. In other words, uh, and I saw this at the university, when I saw the young people graduating you know, from our School of Engineering, I kept on thinking they may not have the same opportunities for professional development as I had. They may not have the opportunities to fly high as, as young eagles in engineering as I had. National pioneer teams, young people, create a National Civil Construction Corps to undertake plan, planning of new development roads and basic civil works. There is so much we could do up north create national pioneer teams to do the work. Members of the pioneer teams to be in the age of 18 to 25 on three-year contracts and to be trained on the job in civil construction and plant operation and maintenance. They'd, it'd be a wonderful opportunity for young people. You'd be overwhelmed with applications. It's got to be set up. You need 
people who have the authority to get on with the job and they have the best expertise. I can remember, you know, 40 and 50 years ago, where the senior public servants were expected to be the best in the world in their field. If you were involved in irrigation or electricity or water supply, you were expected to be operating at world's best practice and you got a kick in the bum if you didn't. Uh, I was with the Hydro in Tasmania. I was going overseas every two years, sort of thing. We, and you know, they say that we were not, uh, you know, operating according to market forces. We were competing with Ontario Hydro and Quebec Hydro and all the rest of it. We were trying to attract industries to Tasmania. We watched their prices like a hawk. We knew exactly uh, the prices of all our world competitors and we organised ourselves and we got a reputation for advanced engineering, the best in the world in some of the things we're doing. We, we, we were first in the world with machine tunnelling and things like that. Absolutely wonderful. But we were a, a government organisation where the top management expected the young engineers uh, to be operating world's best practice and, and, and no excuses. You just got on with the job. And if you wanted to go overseas, you said so and you're off where you went. You were expected to be on top. Some of those clips played today date back 23 years. We face an economic crisis today equal or worse than the Great Depression. With our bubble economy and our lack of integration and value adding, we have slid from being a world leader in ingenuity and a diverse economy to becoming a quarry in a mortgage bubble. The Citizens Party is fully committed to realising Lance Endersby's vision. It is our vision. For more information on the, the material presented, call 1800 636 432. Jump on our website, order a copy of that book, A Voyage of Discovery. But we have lots to do. Join us and let's see to it that we get it done. Thanks for tuning in to the Citizens Insight series. Join me next time.